I would like to welcome everybody to Window into COP24, live from Katowice, Poland. Um, Michelle is the delegate that we'll be hearing from today, and I'm going to introduce her in just a moment, but I thought I'd take some time to introduce Climate Generation and our Window into COP24 program. Um, so first of all, Climate Generation, a Will Steger legacy, was founded in um, 2006 by the polar explorer Will Steger. And his eyewitness to climate change is really what has fueled our work um, that we do both in Minnesota and beyond. Um, he's truly a man that knows no limits. And so we, um, we take that and we put it into all of the work that we do, whether it's with educators, youth, um, the public or influentials in Minnesota and beyond. Um, and our mission is to empower individuals and their communities to engage in solutions to climate change. Again, here's our audiences that we work with. And we also have a strong relationship with COPS that happen once every year. Um, so Climate Generation is accredited organization that can send delegations to these um, conferences on climate change that happen once a year. And so our first delegation we sent in um, 2009, which was COP15 in Copenhagen. And at that time, we were known as the Will Steger Foundation, which is the photograph you can see in the upper left. And we sent a delegation of Midwest youth um, to represent the next generation um, who really is going to be living with the impacts of climate change. And in um, 2015, we sent our next big delegation, um, which was 10 educators from across the nation. And that was in Paris when the Paris Agreement um, was really created. And they acted as critical messengers for climate change and energy literacy because they reach hundreds of students each year as they teach climate change in their classrooms. And then just last year for COP23 in 2017, we sent a multi-sector delegation, um, which included youth, whether that was middle school, high school, or college age, um, policymakers, philanthropy, um, indigenous communities. We had uh, multiple, multiple voices at the table because we recognize that all voices must be represented as we work on climate change um, together. And so this year, we're really excited to send um, four business leaders from Minnesota to COP. Um, and they've been there for this entire first week. And there was one who was there just a little bit until last week. Um, but as we think about COP24 and why business leaders are important, I'd like to give just the basics. So COP24 is the 24th annual conference um, with global leaders to assess the progress we're making on working on climate change and the decisions that are happening so that we can mitigate climate change. Um, and really COP24 specifically is focusing on the Paris Agreement. So that document that was created in 2015 um, is the first framework for setting, assessing, and ratcheting up greenhouse gas reduction goals across the globe. And this conference is really creating the rule book for how countries will communicate and implement um, their goals for the, the Paris Agreement and their greenhouse gas reduction targets. And so businesses provide an important perspective um, because as the Trump administration has promised to pull us out of the Paris Agreement, even though that hasn't really happened yet, um, the official date that it can is actually two days after the November election in 2020. Um, but even though the Trump administration has promised to do that, there are cities, states, and companies who have um, committed to actually um, continuing to honor those goals and targets that the United States have agreed to in the Paris Agreement. And so the private sector is providing the strong leadership that we're seeing in the lack of federal action that we're witnessing around climate change. Um, you may know that Minnesota is a member of the United States Climate Alliance, uh, as well as the We Are Still In initiative. Um, and these are just two groups that are fueling the strong United States commitment to the Paris Agreement. Um, and we're really proud of that. And we're proud of the business leaders that we've sent um, who also have climate commitments and targets themselves. So as we think about COP24, um, I like to quote Patricia Espinoza, who's the Executive Secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, or this body that puts on these big conferences. Um, she had said COP21 saw the birth of the Paris Agreement, um, but in Poland, or as she calls it, Paris 2.0, they're putting together the pieces, directions, and guidelines in order to make the framework really operate. 
So today, I'm really excited to introduce Michelle Courtright, who is the CEO of Fig and Faro, which is a local plant-based restaurant here in Minneapolis, where Climate Generation calls its home. Um, Michelle is one of our four COP24 delegates, and she is a chronic entrepreneur, co-founding creative agencies Maiden, etc., Flock, um, a co-working collaborative, and also Fig and Faro. Um, which is the mission-based restaurant educating guests on the relationship between food and climate change. Michelle has also been actively involved in community, business, and politics as a policy fellow at University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs, board member of the Cedar Cultural Center, member of Women President's Organization, and climate change activist with Friends of Big. Um, before I turn it over to Michelle, I'm going to just remind folks who are watching that if you have any questions during today's webinar, if you hover your mouse over your screen, you'll see a prompt come up for um, either a chat box or a Q&A box in the, in the um, menu bar. And so you're invited to type your questions there and we'll do a Q&A at the end of the webinar um, where we can answer them for you. But I will turn it over to Michelle. I'm going to stop my screen share here. All right. Hi, everyone. Hello from Poland. Um, I uh, have been um, told to give a little uh, brief introduction to those of you out there who don't know who uh, Fig and Faro is. And so I'll um, maybe start from the beginning. Um, I created uh, Fig and Faro as a plant-based restaurant uh, to educate people on the impacts of livestock production on climate change. Uh, most people don't know what a, uh, an enormous contribution it has to greenhouse gases. Um, there's a, a statistic that if every American ate one meat meal less per week, it would be the equivalent of taking 500,000 cars off the road annually. So this is not a small uh, portion of the problem. It's a really large large issue. So um, I uh, am excited to have the restaurant and daily have the opportunity to educate guests uh, who come in and wonder how they can uh, make our environment great again. Um, I uh, wanted to first begin and uh, first say hi to my family and uh, my friends at FIG and everybody out there. Um, I really appreciate uh, my husband watching the kids and, and everything. So this is, this is great as I'm all the way here in Poland uh, getting to enjoy myself. Um, it's like, nice to acknowledge uh, everything that you guys do. And thank you, huge thank you to Climate Generation for the accreditation and the opportunity to be here. It's amazing and it's so great to be here with other business owners and, and business leaders. So thank you. Um, I uh, just want to um, give a little bit of background. Uh, when I came here, I was um, pretty idealistic about, you know, I'm, I'm gonna come here and talk about livestock agriculture and it's gonna be so amazing and there's gonna be so much uh, great information and so many experts, but uh, it's amazing how much information there is here at COP24. Uh, one of the first things I did was kind of spin around for about an hour and just kind of take in how much, uh, you know, there are panels and panels of things going on at any given moment. There are um, thousands of people talking in hundreds of different languages everywhere. It's astonishing. It's really, really crazy. Um, and then in addition, the issue of food is um, there's so much information here. So there are booths and people and sessions and everything talking about soil and organics and uh, farmers' rights and gender equality in agriculture and pretty much every single micro topic you can think about that has to do with, uh, with climate change. And so um, for me, it's been just amazing to discover all of this new information. Um, it's, it's really cool. Um, some of the really interesting stuff I've seen uh, has to deal with uh, deforestation and um, large corporations that are getting involved in, um, in reforestation, reforestation efforts. So that's been really interesting. Um, a lot of talk here about water conservation and obviously that's a big part of, of the food equation. Um, we, when we rely on eating livestock, it's a hugely inefficient way to you know, raise a bunch of crops that you have to 
you know, use a bunch of water to, to do. Fertilizers uh, generally are synthetic and they create um, nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas. Um, and then, you know, you raise these animals, mostly the cattle are kind of the big culprit and they're consuming a lot of water and feed. And so it just ends up being this really uh, inefficient process. So um, kind of learning more about water and, and uh, crops, also learning about farmers and what their situations are. Um, climate change is going to affect them dramatically in the next decade and two or two. And um, we're already seeing the effects, obviously, but um, it's going to get much worse. And they predict that uh, corn and soybeans are going to be one of the hardest hit and that the Midwest is really going to bear the brunt of the problem. So kind of just taking that into account when I'm, you know, learning about all the food, it's, it's really interesting. Um, I uh, wanted to talk about um, a little bit more about how this can be confusing. There's a lot of data and a lot of data points. Um, one of the things that I was really um, kind of impressed but, um, but confused by, um, this is uh, kind of the big guide that they give you. It's the uh, United Nations guide. It's a big, thick uh, catalog of everything you would need to know about uh, climate change and, and um, basically what we're in for on this issue. And they have a big section here on the, um, the climate cost of food. And um, it's, I'll be bringing it back to Minnesota. I'll leave it at the bar if anybody wants to, to read it. It's very interesting stuff. But I'll read you just a passage here. Um, it says, uh, Researchers from Oxford University recently estimated that a global shift to vegetarianism by 2050 would lead to a drop of, uh, sorry, would lead to a drop of GHG emission, emissions of about 60%. Lowering meat consumption would also mean that more land becomes available for farming and that there's less of a need for expensive climate mitigation. So the first part of that is enormous like you know a 60 percent reduction in ghgs i think everybody's looking for that's you know not a silver bullet but you know kind of the big rocks that are um the big main issues uh, about climate change so i thought that was really interesting the the uh thing about expensive climate mitigation uh that really touches on a lot of businesses who are bearing the brunt of the cost of climate change. Uh, I know myself and every other business can look at your insurance rates and they're going through the roof now. Um, even your, your homeowner's policies are doubling and tripling now. Um, so it's, it's really affecting us. And, and this is what we're seeing with these massive storms and we're seeing you know, um, large scale destruction all over the world. These are economic problems. So, so it's a huge problem. But despite this being in the UN's catalog and, and being such a you know, big part of what they're saying, uh, the first thing when I came here and I noticed is that we are all eating, it's an almost entirely meat menu here at the, um, at the conference. And so it's really uh, maybe up to individuals and businesses to start acting immediately on, on this issue. If, if the, um, you know, the UN, the largest body, the largest group of people that are activists in this uh, issue of climate change are serving meat, which is uh, counterproductive to their uh, cause, uh, we really need to rethink the way that we are, um, um, you know, institutionally eating. Uh, this, this goes for corporations. Um, I know I've seen some really big corporations uh, start having meatless Mondays now and uh, doing things like, um, we work actually uh we work as a large uh, co-working company out of new york they've recently gone completely vegan and do not allow meat for any of their catering events um, so you're starting to see that undercurrent of businesses uh, and institutions going uh, meat free um, but we have a lot more work to do so so that's interesting um i wanted to um touch on all of the uh really interesting people that are here that i'm seeing uh, it's, it's not uncommon that you will meet and just be sitting by and striking up a conversation and then you learn that you just met the senator from uh, Nigeria or a legislator uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, this place is just packed with interesting people who are doing great things, lots of activists. Uh, I met uh, while I was standing in line uh, at the registration line, I met uh, these two women that are from Israel and they are doing uh, research on diet and um, 
and climate change, which is exactly, I had so many questions about that. So that was really uh, interesting to see. So really, really cool stuff. Um, I wanted to also, um, hmm, I have notes, hang on a sec. Um, so I just wanted to um, give a little bit more information about um, the um, conversations that we're having here. There is um, one of the scariest conversations that I had um, was with a gentleman. He represents a institutional investment firm. It's one of the largest ones that um, uh, has an impact on climate change. And his clients are uh, generally like family offices and some of the you know, world's billionaires that want to contribute to climate change. And I had asked him, you know, do you feel hopeful about climate change or are you, um, you know, how are you feeling about it? And he said, he's like, this is lovely to go to cops every year. I, I've been to at least 10 of them. And, um, you know, it's, it's people doing the hard work and, and talking about it and getting movement happening. Uh, but he's like, let's be honest, uh, my projections and, and our institution's projections for climate change, uh, we're not looking anymore at one and a half degrees Celsius as the goal. We are looking at uh, six degrees Celsius as the reality. And I've heard that several times at this conference of people saying it is much more dire than we ever thought it was. And these are people that are, you know, they're, they have their pulse on it. Um, I'm just a citizen. I'm just here kind of uh, soaking it up. But um, I think the, um, you know, the disparity between what we see on the media and what we're, what we're hearing is so much different than um, maybe what people are truly planning for on the other side of it. Um, so that was a little depressing, but on the other hand, uh, right after I met him, I went to a conference and it was, uh, put on by, um, uh, it's called Plant for the Planet, and it's an organization that connects businesses with, uh, tree planting organizations around the world, and they say that if we are to, if we plant, uh, currently the earth has, uh, one, uh three trillion trees on it, and if we, um, if we uh, plant three trillion trees, which is not undo, it's not an unrealistic goal, uh, we can cut uh, GHGs by 25%. So I thought this would be a really cool challenge for businesses to get involved in, um, especially you know if you think of somebody like a Starbucks who has a daily amount of customers, if you say, hey, we are going to, every time you buy a latte, we are going to plant a tree. It's, it's affordable. It's not going to break the bank. In fact, they, can, um, they don't even have to internalize the cost. They can pass it along to the consumer. In fact, we need to start passing along costs to the consumer that are externality costs, uh, external costs. Um, and, you know, if you buy a Starbucks uh, coffee every day, you should be planting a tree every day. So there are some really cool things that I think um, companies and uh, institutions and organizations can get involved in. And so I thought about what this means to, uh, to myself and the restaurant. And um, we're going to, starting immediately at FIG, uh, start planting a tree for every guest that visits. So that's just one way that we can get involved. It's a small, much smaller scale than the Starbucks, but there is an app where you can actually um, measure, you know, they, they do the measuring for you because they uh, plant for the planet is uh, uh, actually, we're not planting the trees. It's, it's the, their organizations that are doing it. And we can uh, have a contest. We can actually see all of the guests that have come into the fig, see how many plants, uh, trees we've planted. And then, um, we can have a contest against Starbucks and see how we're doing. So that's my goal. <laughs> In addition to uh, getting the uh, United Nations to change their meal options for next year uh, at COP25. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, um, that's what I've seen so far. And I'd love to open it up to any questions that you guys have. Amazing. That's so awesome that I've seen different models um, for the planting a tree style business product. I don't know if you've heard of Ecosia, which is kind of like a Google alternative where for every search that you do, it's, it counts towards planting a tree. Um, yes. That's an awesome model, definitely. 
Yes. Um, I do invite anyone who's watching to put comments in the Q&A or the chat boxes and we'll pass those along to Michelle so she can answer them. Um, I have a question. So that stat that you heard from that man is very alarming and it definitely feels a little um, hopeless. You know, when we hear stuff like that, it's hard to remain hopeful. Um, and feeling like one individual can have a difference. But I think a lot of what you're getting at is that your diet has this huge impact on what we can do and how we affect um, the bigger economic things that are happening with just the choices that we're making, what we're eating and what we're buying. And so for the people who are watching, um, maybe some of them are vegetarian, maybe they're not. But if you have tips or different um, advice on how to start that lifestyle and start a plant-based focus with your diet, I think that'd be really helpful. Yes, great question. Okay, so here is my challenge, and and I like to say this a lot. So, I want you to um, because often the question is it's too expensive or or whatever. There's a lot of uh, protein issues and lot, lots of things. So so I want everybody who's listening to try this out. So I challenge you to go to the grocery store and go to the um, you know the aisle that has the dried beans. You know the dried lentils, peas. Um, I think you've also got quinoa, rice, um, you know, farro, every barley, you know, all of that, that whole section and go crazy, buy as much as you want, buy, buy everything if you want to, one of everything. Um, just in that section, you know, kind of the starches, rices, beans, all of that, just, just buy a lot of stuff. Then go directly over to the fresh produce and buy as much as you want of anything that's got color, right? So your red beets, your golden beets, your rainbow shard, your broccoli, um, trying to think of kale, spinach, you know, whatever, whatever is interesting. Shiitake mushrooms, go, go for it. Um, and then that's your groceries for the week. Just make it work. You're, you're going to have to sit down. You might want to Google some recipes if you're a recipe person, or if you're really creative, just have fun with it. Roast some vegetables, um, you know, saute things, try new cooking, try braising. If you've never tried to braise things, please don't boil things. That is disgusting and that should never happen. Um, but, you know, get creative and, and have fun. I guarantee that that bill, your grocery bill will be under $50. It doesn't matter if you're shopping at Cub Foods or Whole Foods, that, that bill is going to probably be under 50 bucks and it is going to last you all week. It's protein filled. It's interesting. It's nutritious. Um, it's really all we need, um, you know, to survive. And, you know, if you really think about it, meat is costing, you know, $5 a pound, $7 a pound, you know, somewhere in that range. Um, depends on if you're buying organic and grass-fed and all of that stuff. Um, and if you're eating that every day, you know, that quickly gets to $50 a week, just, just the meat. So I just challenge everybody to just try it out for a week, see how that works. Um, if it's a disaster, I will come to your house and show you how to do it. I'm happy to. But uh, this is really, you know, it's really simple and it's really fun. And it's really tasty. So we should all be happy to, to do it for our planet. And how do you recommend um, communicating with other people about that type of choice? Like, I'm going vegetarian because of this. How have you done that yourself? Um, I think uh, it's hard. I think even my most environmentally friendly friends are still hung up on um, what they might be missing out of meat. And um, a lot of it's cultural. You know, people um, are used to what their parents fed them and, and um, you know, they're they're creatures of habit like we all are. So um, I would say, you know, at least for a week, try to step out of your comfort zone and see what it feels like. Um, I would imagine it's a lot like when people had to switch over and, you know, stop throwing plastic uh, in the garbage bin. You know, remember 20 years ago, you used to throw everything away. And then at some point you were like, ah, this does not feel right. If I throw a plastic thing into the garbage, it just doesn't, sit well with me. Diet is the same way. It's just something that you adapt to and you develop new habits and they're much healthier for you. They're going to make you live longer. And it's a wonderful thing. We're lucky that the, a big part of climate change can be tackled with such an easy, fun thing to do. So we have a class that's watching, um, Sarah Niemeyer's class, and they have a question for you. Okay. Um, 
They actually have a couple. So I'll start with this one. Why did you want to start a restaurant in the first place? <laughs> um, so I've been vegetarian for about 20 years and um, I love to cook. It's one of my favorite things to do. It's very de-stressing and wonderful. Um, so I always dreamed about having my own vegetarian restaurant. And, um, and then of course, when, uh, when I opened this one, it was a much bigger kitchen uh, and it needed uh, a proper staff and chef and everything to run it. Um, I do not have the technical expertise at all to run a commercial kitchen. <laughs> so I luckily have, uh, you know, Chef Charlie, our baker Becky, lots of wonderful, talented people at the restaurant that know how to run a restaurant. Thank you, Josh. Uh, it's it's really uh, it's a much bigger task than I ever thought it would be. Um, if you ever try to glamorize owning a restaurant, uh, please don't. It's 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 very uh, it's a difficult business. But I'm so happy that I have a staff of dedicated people who care about the mission and kind of stick by us. And I'm so glad we've had guests that stick with us when we're trying out new things and, you know, experimenting and, you know, especially if the first few months were really rocky, but we have hit our stride and I'm so happy and so proud to, to have a restaurant. Another question that we have. So what made you motivated you to inform people about climate change? Who or what inspired you to get involved in climate change action? Good question. I, um, you know, I think it was maybe two years ago that I started seeing statistics come up about climate change and food. And I remember that I couldn't believe the numbers that I was seeing. There's a statistic about um, a hamburger and it says uh, it requires something like 8,000 gallons of water to produce one hamburger. And I was like, how can that be? That doesn't even make sense. And then I, as I did more research, it does make sense. It's a very inefficient process that we grow corn and, you know, and we, and all of these things and we water them and we produce them and we use energy to um, process them. And then we feed it to another <laughs> animal. We're an animal. We feed it to another animal and then they eat it and consume it and Unfortunately, uh, many, uh, uh, many of them uh, create uh, methane from it, which is a very powerful greenhouse gas. And then, um, and then we kill them and then we eat it. So it just seems inefficient. It, seems, it seemed crazy. And, and so um, I guess the more I read about it, I became more passionate about it. And, and I think if you guys do your research too, you'll find it's just the numbers are staggering uh, how much water and land use is involved in livestock production. Do you have any favorite resources that you've um, either used over the years or books you've read, movies you've watched that people could also tune into? Yeah, you know, um, Netflix has a great documentary called Cowspiracy. It's kind of old now and some of the information is outdated um, because we never really used to track a lot of um, like we never really tracked methane before in our greenhouse gas cal calculation. It was usually um, carbon emissions, so um, stuff like that, you know, updates. But that's a great a great one if you're just bored and want to watch something. Um, there's also um, really great research coming out of the university or Oxford University. Um, Marco Springman is kind of the lead researcher on that, and he is speaking out, speaking on a panel here tomorrow. So I'll have some information to update on the blog. But he's you know he's got this whole school behind him, the School of Food, and they just do tremendous uh, work with food and climate change. So so those would be my two biggest recommendations. So we have a question from Janet, who's watching. Um, you discussed that a vegetarian diet can reduce greenhouse gas carbon uh, by 60%. Do you have any statistics on how a vegetarian diet would also help reduce healthcare costs? Oh, gosh. You know, I, I don't know that offhand and I'm sure there's some great information on there. I just read an article and I'm trying to remember uh, who it was, but um, I believe it was in the Washington Post, but they talked about um, uh, heart health and how this, uh, you know, when you eat a um, plant-based diet, it, uh, it almost corrects heart disease immediately. It's a really um, it's a, it's, you know, plant-based eating is really, really good for you. And, um, so I don't know what those external costs are, but can you even imagine, I'm sure 
Um, you know, heart disease is the, I believe the leading killer in the country. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it's one of them at least. And if we were just controlling, um, our health with our diet, uh, yeah, I, I can't imagine how much money it would save. Definitely. Um, someone who's watching Bazak um, posted a link, which I'm happy to share um, with folks who are watching once I do a follow-up email, but it's um, from the Harvard University and they can um, have resources or they have resources on becoming a vegetarian. So I'm happy to share that too. But it's great to have- Bazak is my husband and, and the wonderful person watching our children for two weeks, so. Oh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will share that with everyone for sure. Um, so we do have another question. Paul Hawkins' book, Drawdown, um, talks about food waste becoming a huge contributor to climate emissions and that 40% of the food we reduce or sorry, 40% of the food we produce never makes it to the dinner table. Can you talk about ways uh, people can reduce the amount of food they waste? Yes, oh my goodness. Um, so I, uh, this is also in this book, which I will leave at the bar at FIG, <laughs> but uh, there's an entire article about food waste. And um, if you can imagine that uh, you know, food production is one of the leading causes of of climate change, food waste is it, it's definitely a part of that, and and it's creating its own greenhouse gases, and then it's never used. It's not even eaten. It's an enormous problem. So um, I think the big the bigger fish to fry on this one, so to speak, uh, is the uh, institutional um, cooking. That's where I've heard most of the waste is is at. So. Um, you know, think about hospitals, cafeterias, schools, jails, um, you know, anywhere where people are eating en masse. Um, there is a new app. Uh, I don't remember what it's called, but I think if you do food waste app, um, there'll be some information online. And um, basically, it allows corporations to track their food waste. And um, and uh, it's also going to be, it's also coming to the food service industry soon, uh, if not already. So I already asked them to send me information for our restaurant. Um, but basically, you, um, let's say Ikea makes a tray of meatballs and, you know, Joe puts them in, puts, uh, takes those meatballs and is about to throw them away. He has to record with his name and the time and the date and everything, how many meatballs he threw away. And um, all of this data is aggregated and allows management uh, and uh, procurement departments to, you know, see trends, you know, like, oh, they are opening a brand new thing of meatballs every day at 3 p.m. They should only be doing half of that uh, because that's how sales are. So it's kind of, um, you know, looking at it from a data perspective. Um, I think oftentimes we think of food waste as I need to clean my plate, uh, which by the way, we do need to be uh, ordering smaller portions as, you know, as a, you know, as a country, we have huge portions. So we really need to get that under control, but at an institutional level, um, that's, that's really where the change can happen. Hmm. Um, I think this is an excellent, excellent flow into talking about how Fig and Faro educates guests on food. Um, I've been to the restaurant, I'm a vegetarian, and I love that the menu itself has, this is why we're plant-based and it like spills that out so it's an education resource. Um, but can you speak to other initiatives or ways that you guys educate guests on um, topics like this? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, yeah, just about every day we have people that uh, have never heard of the issue of, of um, uh, livestock agriculture contributing to climate change. So that's exciting. I feel like every day we're educating new people. Uh, we've worked with the um, city of Minneapolis and the mayor of Minneapolis to educate them and issue a, uh, uh, Mayor Jacob Fry issued a proclamation for citizens to eat less meat. So more as a, just a acknowledgement, I think, um, having, that, having that realization for, for citizens and the community, that's always good. Um, we are currently working with the uh, Minneapolis public school system as their plant-based protein partner uh, to educate um, green teams and cafeterias and uh, provide a plant-based option. Uh, hopefully at every school one day uh, is, is our goal to, to get there. Um, and then, yeah, we, we have our climate series, which is um, kind of like a supper club salon type series. And that's once a month. And we usually have a guest speaker that will talk about, um, you know, climate change from their perspective. Um, 
and uh, we've had several different guests in um, and in January we're, we're going to be featuring somebody from the fashion industry um, to talk about that so yeah we feel like um, having those conversations and getting the community there and talking about climate change is really important and um, that's how we're gonna make this happen the more that this is an issue and the more we realize how big of an issue it is um, I think that everybody, it, be, it be, just becomes normal to talk about it and, and then we find our own solutions every day. Definitely. So for the last question, I'm wondering if you can speak to something that you're excited to go to at COP24 or something that has given you hope while you're there um, and powers you through the rest of this week. Oh, that's so great. Um, I just love that everybody here is so passionate. You know, like I said before, everybody is speaking you know, hundreds of different languages. And when you see them walking the halls, everybody is, you know, uh, super dedicated and thrilled. They've all been up here, you know, they've been here every day, you know, from early morning to late at night, there's no sleeping happening here. Mm -hmm. Everybody is just working hard. So that's really, really inspirational. And then um, just the people when you get to know them, you know, it's, it's incredible. Everybody is really, really passionate and, and wants to solve this issue. Um, and the great thing, the really important thing to know is that although this is a policy structure, you know, the whole reason that the UN is here is to create, you know, a framework to, um, for countries to um, come to an agreement about um, climate change, that the real work is happening with these NGOs and with the institutions, the academics, the, you know, all of these, it's the people uh, that are here, the, the 30,000 people that are, you know, supplementing that and making progress move forward. Uh, we all know in, in the U.S., we're not going to get any policy, policy through right now in this administration. It's just not going to happen. So it's up to us. And that's kind of thrilling. It's, it, government moves too slow. We can move faster. I'm, I'm excited about that challenge. Definitely. Well, we're so proud to have you representing Minnesota and the leadership that we have here. Um, and if you haven't been following along on Michelle's blog, she's writing daily, um, and as well as our other delegates. So I encourage you to follow our digests. Um, I'm going to sign off here with just a quick uh, reminder on the different ways that you can follow this COP24 delegation we have. So there's four business leaders over there right now from Best Buy, Target, BWBR, and Fig and Faro. Um, and you can find all of that information on how to follow us and what they're doing at climategen.org slash COP24. Um, and we're also retweeting and sharing all of the amazing content that they are gathering over there on our social media channels um, and with the, has the hashtag MNCOP24. Um, I also encourage everybody to save the date for our last final webinar um, from Poland, which is happening tomorrow at 2 p.m., where uh, you will hear from Alexis ludwig Vogan from Best Buy. Um, and so that you can also register for at climategen.org COP24, as well as an amazing uh, post-COP panel that we're going to have on December 19th at 4 p.m. So that's going to be in Minnesota at the University of Minnesota, the Institute on the Environment. But we're also live streaming it from YouTube. Um, so anyone who isn't from Minnesota can tune in and hear from Michelle. She will be there, as well as our delegate, Jesse. Um, and we're hoping for others as well as potential students to join as well. So that'll be a really great um, rounded way to see what happened at COP24 and hear about the progress that was made. Um, and so I want to just thank Michelle again for sharing your experience um, and the amazing facts about agriculture and food. And um, we really look forward to following you on the rest of your COP24 journey. Great. Thank you guys. Thank you for watching. And uh, if you can hear the vacuum cleaners in the background, they're, uh, they're vacuuming around my laptop here. So uh, it is late okay. at night there, isn't it? Right. Yes. <laughs> it's about to shut down over there in Poland. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much for joining and we'll be in touch.